Imagine engineers in the late 1990s gathered around a blueprint of the perfect regional aircraft, one with the speed of a jet and the efficiency of a turboprop. They didn't just dream it, they built it. The Bombardier Q400 was a masterpiece of modern engineering, and almost immediately it started to fail. What fatal flaw was hidden inside its brilliant design? How did its advanced technology become a nightmare for the very airlines it was meant to save, and why did its greatest strengths become its biggest weaknesses? weaknesses, here's what's really happening. On one side, you had regional jets like their own CRJ-200, fast, comfortable, but thirsty for fuel. On the other, you had turboprops, economical, efficient, but often perceived as slow, noisy, and outdated. The Canadian manufacturer saw a gap. What if they could build an aircraft that offered the best of both worlds? What if they could create a turboprop with the soul of a jet? This wasn't just an idea, it was a mission. The goal was to build a jet killer. The result, unveiled in 1997, was the Dash 8 Q400, and on paper, it was nothing short of revolutionary. It was powered by two colossal Pratt & Whitney PW150A engines, the most powerful turboprops ever fitted to a regional aircraft. They allowed the Q400 to cruise at speeds between 360 and 410 knots, nearly indistinguishable from the jets it was designed to compete with. For routes of 500 to 1,000 miles, it could arrive within minutes of a jet, all while burning significantly less fuel, just 1.8 tons per hour compared to the 3.5 tons guzzled by a CRJ-200. The innovation didn't stop at speed. The Q in Q400 stood for quiet. Bombardier had installed a sophisticated noise and vibration suppression system, creating a cabin environment that was 30% quieter than older props, shattering the stereotype of a teeth-rattling turboprop experience. With 78 seats, it had the capacity for high-demand routes, and its remarkable short-field performance meant it could take off from runways as short as 4,600 feet, opening up smaller airports that jets couldn't serve. It was the total package. By 2010, orders had flooded in for 600 Q400s, with 400 already delivered to airlines across the globe. Bombardier hadn't just built a new plane, they had seemingly created a new category of air travel. But what if the very thing Thing that made it a masterpiece was also its fatal flaw. Buried beneath the romance and the record-breaking specs lay a calculated gamble that cut against everything the regional aviation market truly believed in. Think the Q400's obsession with performance was a guaranteed win? Think again. For the small, scrappy regional airlines that were its target customers, the Q400 wasn't just an aircraft, it was a shock to the system. Its jet-like performance demanded jet-like operations, and that was a cost and complexity they were simply not prepared for. The dream on paper quickly became a nightmare on the tarmac. First, there was the challenge for the pilots. Flying the Q400 wasn't like flying a traditional slower turboprop. Its high cruising speed and steep descent profiles meant pilots had less time to think and react. Landings were faster and required more precision, putting immense stress on both the crew and the aircraft's components. This complexity demanded a higher caliber of training, closer to what a jet pilot would receive. The annual training costs ballooned to around $200,000 per pilot, a staggering sum for regional carriers operating on razor-thin margins. Then came the maintenance. The Q400 was a sophisticated machine. Its advanced avionics and powerful PW150A engines were marvels of engineering, but they were also maintenance-hungry. The aircraft required on average 1.5 maintenance hours for every single hour it spent in the air. Its big biggest competitor, the ATR-72, needed only 1.1 hours. That 30% increase in hangar time meant less time in the sky earning revenue. The high landing speeds also led to accelerated wear on tires and brakes, adding another 25% to the cost, an extra $50,000 per aircraft per year. But the real damage came from a series of high-profile incidents that shattered the aircraft's reputation. Between 2007 and 2008, Scandinavian Airlines or SAS, suffered three separate crashes involving the Q400's landing gear failing on touchdown. Miraculously, there were no fatalities, but the images of the broken aircraft skidding down runways were devastating. The incidents cost Bombardier an estimated $100 million in reputational damage and led SAS to ground its entire fleet permanently. The plane that was supposed to be perfect now had a question mark hanging over its safety and reliability. For airlines, loving how the Q400 
400 flew wasn't enough when they hated what it took to keep it flying, so it was a demanding aircraft. But surely its incredible performance made up for the cost. Think again. Here's where the math fell apart and sealed the Q400's fate. While Bombardier was chasing engineering perfection, its European rival, ATR, was focused on something far more mundane and far more important, economics. The battle for the skies wasn't going to be won at 400 knots, it was going to be won on the balance sheet. And this is where the Q400, for all its brilliance, was hopelessly outmatched. The core of the problem was its operating cost. The Q400 cost roughly $3,500 per hour to fly. The ATR-72, its direct competitor, came in at just $2,900 per hour. That 15-20% to cost difference was a chasm that no amount of speed could bridge. Airlines are businesses of tiny margins, and a $600 per hour saving is a monumental advantage. But what about the speed? Didn't that count for something? In the real world of regional aviation, it barely mattered. For the short-haul routes of 300 to 500 miles that are the bread and butter of this market, the Q400's speed advantage translated to a time saving of only 10 to 15 minutes. Passengers barely noticed, and it certainly wasn't enough to justify a higher ticket price. Airlines quickly realized they were paying a premium for performance they didn't need and couldn't monetize. Meanwhile, the ATR-72-600 was a masterpiece of ruthless pragmatism. It was slower, yes, but it was also simpler. It had 10% lower fuel burn, and crucially, its spare parts were 50% cheaper, its training programs were less intensive, and its maintenance schedule was less demanding. For airlines, the choice became painfully clear. The Q400 was the perfect aircraft for performance, but the ATR was the perfect aircraft for profits. The market voted with its checkbook. By 2020, ATR had amassed over 1,200 orders for its 72600 model, double the 600 total orders the Q400 had managed to secure in its entire lifetime. The jet killer was being systematically defeated by a slower, simpler, but far smarter rival. The Q400 was losing the sales war, but the final nail in its coffin wouldn't come from a competitor. It came from inside its own house. Every great tragedy has a turning point a moment where a difficult situation becomes an impossible one. For the Q400, that moment was the birth of its ambitious sibling, the C-Series. While the Q400 program was struggling to find its financial footing, Bombardier was pouring every ounce of its resources and capital into a massive, company-defining gamble, developing a clean-sheet, next-generation, narrow-body jet to compete with Boeing and Airbus. The C-Series, now known as the Airbus A220, was a a brilliant aircraft, but it was also a financial black hole. The development costs spiraled out of control, eventually costing Bombardier over $5 billion. The company was bleeding money and it was forced to make brutal choices about its future. It simply could not afford to sustain two ambitious, high-cost aircraft programs at the same time. The C-Series was the future. The Q400, despite its technological prowess, was a problem that had to be solved. The end came swiftly and quietly. In in 2021, with its finances stretched to the breaking point by the C-Series, Bombardier announced it was halting production of the Q400 indefinitely. The production line that had created the world's most advanced turboprop fell silent. The entire program, along with the historic de Havilland Canada name, was sold off for just $300 million, a fraction of its development cost and a stunning admission of defeat. Today, the legacy of this once-revolutionary aircraft is fading fast. As of 2025, it's estimated that only around 50 Q400s remain active in fleets around the world. The plane that was meant to conquer the skies was now a rarity, overtaken by simpler, more economical rivals. The world's most advanced turboprop didn't go out with a bang. It just quietly exited the stage, a victim not of its failures, but of its own overachieving brilliance. The story of the Q400 is a clear-cut case of winners and losers. The biggest winner was, without a doubt, ATR. By sticking to a philosophy of simplicity, reliability, and low operating costs, it completely dominated the market. Today, ATR aircraft make up 70% of the regional turboprop sector, with over 1,500 orders
orders for its 72600 model. Airlines like Flybe, which famously pivoted from the Q400 to ATRs, reported saving $1 million per aircraft per year. They chose profit over performance, and they were rewarded for it. The biggest loser was Bombardier, the company that had the vision and the engineering genius to create the Q400 ended up losing an estimated $2 billion on the program. It was a painful lesson that brilliance isn't enough if it doesn't align with the harsh realities of the market. And then there were the airlines and operators who bet on the Q400 stuck with high-cost niche fleets that were difficult to operate profitably. The Q400 proved that in aviation, engineering perfection doesn't guarantee market fit. In fact, it can be a liability. This story mirrors the fate of other aviation icons. The Concorde was too fast and too costly. The Airbus A380 was too big and too niche. And the Q400 was too complex and too expensive for the regional world it was meant to serve. Each was an engineering marvel undone by the cold, hard logic of economics. They pushed the boundaries of what was possible, but they couldn't survive their own brilliance. Was this a tragic failure of a single aircraft, or does it signal a deeper the truth about the limits of innovation. You see, the Q400's legacy is a stark and uncomfortable question. Is perfection even possible or desirable? The industry's answer seems to be a resounding no. Will future designs forever prioritize simplicity over ambition, consigning groundbreaking ideas to the drawing board? Or will a new generation of engineers find a way to build an aircraft that is not only perfect in the air, but also perfect on the balance sheet? That remains the ultimate, unresolved challenge. Click here to check out another one of our videos.